We're talking today with Ted McCormick of Blenheim, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, Ted, can you start us off with some background on yourself? Uh, to begin with, where and when were you born? I was born in uh, Standish, Michigan. My people come from Taos, and they, at that time they didn't have a hospital in Taos, so closest uh, was was uh, Standish, so that's where I was born. Okay, so if for people not very familiar with Michigan geography, where where in the state is that, or where in the mitten is it? It's uh, uh, northern Michigan. But closer to Lake Huron than Lake Michigan? Yes, yeah. right on. Because okay. Tallis is right on Lake Huron, so that Correct. area. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and now, did you grow up in that area? No, I grew up in Flint, Michigan, and uh, went to high school at, uh, uh, through uh, Flint Public Schools. Okay. And what did your family do for a living at that time? My father was in the automotive industry, uh, like most people who were from Flint. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, did your mother work, or did she stay home? Uh, she was a homemaker okay. for the most part of my life. Yeah. yeah, and how many kids were in the family? Four, including myself. Okay, and where did you fit in the sequence? I was the uh, second oldest. I caught all the problems that my brother <laughs> all right. got away with, so it was one of those, yeah. Okay, uh, and then well, when did you finish high school? 1968. Okay. Now, at that point, did you have plans to go to work or go to college or? I was indifferent. I hired him to, uh, I had somewhat of an artistic creative ability and I hired him to build car signs as an apprentice and uh, then uh, GM called and uh, I went to work at Buick in uh, <clears throat> 1968. All right. Now, at this point, uh, how aware were you of Vietnam and the draft and all that sort of thing? I grew up with Vietnam. I was indifferent to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I believed that it was going to be over by the time I reached uh, you know, drafting age, so I wasn't really too concerned about it. I was uh, living middle class and I enjoyed mm -hmm. it. All right. Uh, now, did you know people who were already gone? Or? Yes. And did any of them come back and say anything about it? No, for the most part, uh, they were Vietnam veterans and they, they pretty much stayed to themselves as far as combat experience. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really get too much information. And again, I was indifferent to it. Right. And had other stuff to do at that point. Correct. All right. Uh, and so uh, when did you get your draft notice? Uh, it was. Uh, Six months later, I believe, uh, when I was drafted, and uh, after I hired into Buick, and then, uh, and it was during uh, Johnson's uh, upsurge in '69. Well, Johnson's gone in '69, right. but yeah. but they had brought in a lot of. They drafted more in '68, and they were still taking a lot. Of, so did you get the notice in late 1968 and then report in 69, or did you think uh, you got it? It was 69 I got, okay. the, I got the yeah. notice. Yeah. yeah, when they still had a very high level of draft at that point. Oh, uh, yeah, correct. Yeah. Did. Mm -hmm. Nixon has gone in and announced that he has a plan, but uh, at that point the draft is still very high. What plan? Yeah, yeah well, he didn't have one, but never mind that. It sounded good at the time. Okay, uh, so early, early 16, you get your draft notice. Now, did you have, before you got the notice, had you already gone someplace for a draft board physical or anything like that? No, I hadn't okay. been called at all no, okay. at that point. All right. Uh, so once you get the draft notice, then what happens? I uh, did my obligation. Most of my family were World War II veterans, mm -hmm. World War I veterans, uh, uh, the Revolutionary War. I mean, that's how far my people go back. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay. so it was my obligation. I mean, I will not deny I didn't think about Canada, which mm -hmm. was... 30 minutes away. Right. But uh, I had a certain obligation to my family, too, right. despite my views. Okay. And now let's kind of take us to sort of through the physical process. You've got the notice to say, okay, it's my turn. All right, I'm going to go. Then what does the Army then make you do? Where do you go report to first, and what happens? I went to Fort Knox for uh, AIT, or I mean, excuse me, uh, basic training, and then uh, from did, there. I did you go to Detroit first for physical or something? Oh, yes, I did. I saw the usual uh, teddy bear 
uh, people with teddy bears and dolls and uh, that kind of thing, which is kind of shocking. But uh, uh, I was there to, to do my job. Mm -hmm. So now, when you go down and you, and, and you report, you get there for the physical. Uh, what proportion of people do you think were trying to find some sort of dodge as opposed to just doing what you were doing? Seventy-five percent. Okay, so you have a lot of guys looking for a way out if they can find one. Maybe that's a little high. Yeah. There might be someone that, that disputes that, but okay. from what I saw, uh, I would say 50 to 75 percent did not want to go. Yeah, well that's probably true, and then the question is how hard did they try? How not, hard uh, did they try? Well, yeah. I mean, if you had a background in uh, acting or uh, you were a transsector, well, I don't know if I should say this. And a transvestite. Or, yeah, what's... Uh, Politic or politically uh, accurate, you know. uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, there was uh, there was people trying to get out of that. And how much of that do you think worked? Ten percent. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, the people that deserved it, uh, I I met a few people who were Forrest Gump. Uh, wanted you know the same mm -hmm. yeah, should not have been in the service. Right but we're probably uh, passed on because of uh, that. Yeah, need for manpower. All right, so you get through that, and now do they bus you to Fort Knox or fly you or whatever? Uh, we were bused to, to Fort Knox uh, for, uh, from Detroit to uh, Fort Knox. Okay, and roughly when did you arrive at Fort Knox? Uh, it, was, um, it was June, uh, I can't recall the exact date. Okay, day. but June of 69. Correct. Okay. All right. What kind of reception did you get when you arrived? Uh, typical, you know, get the hell off the bus, you're in the army now type of thing. You know, the, uh, the mind screw up, uh, haircuts, and, you know, get mine and all that stuff. Okay. You know, basically, having you learn the, the, the basics of what it takes to work together and stuff. Yeah. Now, did you have any idea what to expect when you got there? Not really. All right. You know. Uh, now, the first few days there, what kinds of things do they have you doing? Uh, repetitive things. It, I, it was all designed to get you to work together, I, I believe. You know. But were they giving you things like aptitude tests or physical tests? Or? Oh, yes. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, your aptitude tests you receive there. But depending on whatever you need, or excuse me, whatever they need is where you go. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you're uh, brilliant. Uh, if they need somebody in infantry, that's where you go. Mm -hmm. So my aptitude was chemistry, so then they put me in the 11B10, which is light weapon. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that makes sense. Well, they were using a lot of chemical weapons at that point. So. <laughs> Good That's way. very true. All right. Uh, now, how easy or hard was it for you to adjust to Army life uh, in basic? Very easy. I'm a team player. I was raised all my life hunting and fishing. And, you know, um, I, did, I fell into it very easily. Mm -hmm. Were you in good physical shape when you went in? Excellent shape. Mm -hmm. All right. So you're familiar, you, you handled a rifle before? Yes. Familiar with weapons, and you can handle the the marches and that kind of stuff. And right. and when they give you orders, you don't argue with them. No. All right. Now, were there other guys there who were having a harder time? Yes, I think when you put someone through that, there's going to be an, an emotional break within some people because they're not uh, capable of hand you know, whether that be a personality disorder. What you're going to they're going to crop up. Mm -hmm. I'd say maybe one percent. I don't know the. Mm -hmm. Odds, but uh, there's going to be certain people who can't handle it. Mm -hmm. Now, do you have other guys who just, while they get through it, uh, they get themselves in a lot more trouble? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, you certainly fall into those too. Yeah. All right. Now, were the guys that you were training with in your training company were they all pretty much out of Michigan, or were they from a lot of places? Pretty much from Michigan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what was the ethnic mix of them, as far as you can tell? I would say. Pretty, uh, pretty close. Uh, you know, twelve percent blacks. Pretty much re the same as the population. Okay. I think that's that's purpose. Of, you know, right. We do that on purpose. So. Okay. 
Uh, so, because, so it's not the kind of thing where it's 50% black or something no. like that. Yeah. No. <clears throat> okay. All right. Um, now, how long did the basic training last? Uh, three months. Okay. So they're giving you, it's not just the, for a while it was eight weeks, but they vary it. Uh, you know, and, and I'm vague. I'm, yeah. I'm thinking three months. Yeah. Of, but that's, it, that's still actually quite possible. I hear a lot of things. If that's how you remember, that's what sticks right. with you. That's, that's what sticks with me. Where we go with that. Yeah, no. Okay. Uh, now, what happens at the end of BASIC? Uh, then you receive your orders and uh, whatever your orders are is what school you attend, which is an advanced individual training. Mm -hmm. And then, you, you know, you, you go to your prospective, uh, you know, uh, field station. Right. And so what base were you sent to for EIT? Uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana, which is infantry. Mm-hmm. All right. How do they get you down to Fort Polk? Fly. We flew. Okay. And was that just on a military aircraft or, uh, or I chartered think it was. civilian? I or? think it was chartered, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, compare the facilities a little bit. Uh, what's different between Fort Polk and, and Fort Knox? Weather. Um, other than that, it was kind of like basically the same thing, you know, maybe a little bit more advanced about escape and evasion and some of the techniques that you would use as far as, you know, infantry, um, artillery, you know, stuff like that. Um, but, you know, it was basically the very basic uh, for you to survive. Okay. Now Fort Polk had a reputation sort of the, it was the Little Vietnam or something like that, or it was a place where they were uh, supposedly trying to train people largely to go to Vietnam. Now did they have things like a, sort of a mock-up Vietnamese village to train in and that kind of thing? Yeah, if you want to compare that to Disney World, that would be fine. Um, Vietnam was OJT, mm -hmm. so there was nothing they could prepare you to climb them mountains. Yeah. Uh, especially in I Corps. Mm -hmm. No training. Rockies wouldn't compare. So, you know, I met a lot of guys who kept training thinking, well, the more stuff I'm going to take, the less I'm going to have to serve. Mm -hmm. But even that, nothing can prepare you for that. Okay. Now, when you were at Fort Polk, what kinds of people did you have training at? Uh, the same guys I went through basic with, a lot of them. But in terms of who, who were the were the instructors? Were the instructors guys back from Vietnam? Or? Yeah, yeah, for the most part, yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, they were laissez-faire. I mean, you know, it was, you know, it just was not real. It was kind of like a joke. I, I don't know how their uh, training is set up for Afghanistan, but it's not the real world. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think you could really keep, come up with that. Okay. So. Uh, and the drill instructors, are people like the people who had been there, they were not making much of an effort to explain to you what it was really like? Or? Well, yeah, they were, and, and I'm sure to a certain extent uh, they were dedicated. And what they did was a list of a lot of apathy. Mm -hmm. You know, here comes another crew. You know, it was like, you're looking how long? Ten years they went through this. So it was just like, uh, maybe they didn't mean to be apathetic, but it, to me it, mm -hmm. it was. So. Yeah. But, you know, I, uh, I just wanted to get it over with and, uh, like most guys, just get back on with my life, you know. Mm -hmm. so. All right. Uh, now, while you're at Fort Polk, do you get any time to go off the base or do anything else? I mean, do they loosen up at all? I did once, but you got to sit together because there's <laughs> people that want your money, mm -hmm. you know, so. And it's kind of in the middle of nowhere, too. Oh, it, it is, yeah. man. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was kind of tough down there. All right. So, uh, now, did, were you offered the opportunity to go to NCO school or any other specialized training? No, not that I can recall. Okay. Uh, I was going to uh, become a warrant officer for helicopter pilots, but then I, I didn't want to extend the two years, so I turned it down. All right. At what point did you get that option offered to you? <clears throat> Fort Polk, I can't remember when. Okay. Yeah, because they needed helicopter pilots pretty badly, and, and so they were yes, they did. pulling them out. But you places. know what I was looking at, hey, it's a job I can use after service. Mm -hmm. Even though I have Buick, uh, there's no call for 11B10s mm -hmm. after service. So. 
Right. Now, when you're doing your infantry training, what, what weapons are you training on? Uh, it was the M16, M14, M60 machine gun, uh, 45. Uh, I don't think we ever shot the AK. Uh, Did you get grenade launchers? or Yeah, grenade thump guns. You know, the whole yeah, thing. Pretty much the full range of the light infantry yeah. weapons. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, now, how long does uh, the AIT last? Three months. Okay. So when when do you finish then? November. Uh, okay, so like the end of '69. Now, do you get to go home before this? Yeah, I, I went home on Thanksgiving and left on the 31st of uh, November of '69. Uh, okay, so you just got a short leave home then, because right. some at, at times it was as much as a month, mm -hmm. other times two weeks, ten days, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, uh, where did you? Once that Thanksgiving leave was over, uh, where did you report to? Uh, Fort Lewis. Okay, so you're going up to Washington then. Right. All right. Uh, and once you got there, what happened? Um, just waited for, um, you know, replacement to go. Do you remember anything about what the mood or the atmosphere of people there was like? The total depression. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because you have to remember, I was at the end. Everybody knew what was going on. These were on sec black guys were on second deployment. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just uh, really depressing. So. so, about how long did you have to sit around, do you think? It was about three days, I think, and then got orders, and then off we went. Okay. Now, at that point, do you have any equipment with you, or just your personal yeah. belongings? or Just uh, your duffel bag. All right. And then have they given you a bunch of shots and so forth before you went, or did no, that go on? I can't recall, but I'm, I'm sure they did somewhat. Okay. All right. Uh, and then how do they physically get you to Vietnam? Uh, charter, steak dinner. Some guys had to go over in a boat. Yeah. Okay, you flew. Now, do you fly the northern route, Alaska, Japan, that kind of thing? Or? We went through, uh, yeah, went through... Uh, Alaska, Japan, and um, and then uh, Cameron, I think. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and what do you recall about the plane ride? Depression. <laughs> well, depression and uh, you know anticipation. Mm -hmm. And they have stewardesses working on the flight. Oh uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. And how did they act? Uh, they try to cheer people up, you know. I don't think there was that many people getting drunk or anything, mm -hmm. so it was probably well behaved for them, so. Yeah. All right. Uh, now, land at Cameron Bay. Uh, do you remember if you landed during the day or at night? I landed during the day. Okay. We got off uh, the plane. I looked around and some guys water skiing out there. And, and, and I'm thinking, hell, this isn't going to be that bad. <laughs> All right. Uh, was it uh, was it hot at that point? Yeah, really extremely hot. If uh, I've had dreams about Vietnam, and if you want to have one, you wake up when you wake up in Vietnam. It's the um, unbearable heat, the smell of urine, feces, fish, all combined into one. So, unmistakable. Mm -hmm. So. All right. Now, once you get off the plane, what do they do with you? Then we uh, went to a replacement company, and then uh, instead of uh, flying us up to uh, Fubai, which was my base camp, uh, we went on uh, cattle trucks and drove up through uh, the High Flying Pass and just amazing scenery. So you drove a good ways up the coastline of South Vietnam because Cameron's pretty far south relative to, to I I Igor and Fuba. Through Da Nang and you know, right. up to uh, Way. Okay. And, and so what do you get to see along the way? I was, I, you know, I did, had no idea about the culture. Uh, I was shocked to see how poor these people mm -hmm. were. I had no idea what poverty was. And, you know, and then I happened to look over and I see Mama-san 
doing a number two in the rice battery, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, don't these people have bathrooms here? You know, well, she's out fertilizing the rice. Mm -hmm. That's common, man. So, you know, it was just that culture shock that you go through. And, wow, you know, I'm in a different uh, thing here. Okay. Now, you're traveling up in, in trucks. Now, did you have armed escorts in convoy, or was it pretty casual? Yeah, it was about like three convoys, something like that. Mm -hmm. They're all replacements. So, we uh, drove all the way to, to, to way. Well, <clears throat> Camp Eagle was just south of Wakes. Mm -hmm. All right, and Camp Eagle is sort of the main headquarters base for the 101st, 101st Airborne. Airborne. Yeah, well, Fubai. Yeah. With their, their you know, I think that was a Marine base camp at one time, and then it turned into the 101st. Yeah, and they're all, yeah, I mean, it was all Marines originally, and then more and more Army stuff goes in and, and takes over different parts of it. But they're Fubai and Way are fairly close to each other, so, all right. Uh, and Camp Evans is farther north than that. Right, a little bit, yeah. yeah. and that was the 3rd Brigade base, but, okay. But you go up, uh, how long did it take to make that drive up from Cameron? God, I couldn't tell you. It isn't very far. Okay. Uh, three, four hours? Because okay, so it was hours, it wasn't days or anything like oh, that. Oh, no, no. no. Okay. I, I couldn't tell you how okay. long. Now, had they, where did they tell you you were going to the 101st? They, they didn't say. Oh. They said you were assigned to the 101st. No, but I mean, when they, but did you find that out when you were at Cameron or before that? Yeah, yeah, okay. right. All right. Uh, now, did you know anything about the 101st as opposed to anybody else? Uh, yeah, I knew it was Air, Mo Air Mobile, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was leg. I wasn't uh, Air Mobile, you know, I was uh, qualified to uh, helicopter assault. Mm -hmm. uh, I think during that year they changed it so where, you know, you didn't have to be uh, uh, qual or qualified to. Yeah, you didn't have, have to have jump school or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. just be uh, air mobile. Mm -hmm. So, All right. they were changing the division. And okay. Now, what specific unit were you assigned to when you got up there? Uh, Bravo Company, 1st uh, 327th Infantry. All right. Uh, and. Were they in the base camp when you joined them, or were they out in the field? They were out in the field, but they came in when I was in the base camp, when we first arrived. And it was funny, because uh, <clears throat> here I am, these guys look like dead killers. And I'm in you know, greens. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying nothing. And uh, these three guys across the bunk, we started drinking, and uh, one guy said to the other one, well, we eat enough of these pills. It's going to give us symptoms of malaria and get out of the field. So I watched him, and they started eating pills and drinking. And they did this for about four or five hours, and then they killed all three of them. So that's when I realized, man, am I going to survive this? You know? How bad is it out there for them, them guys to do this? You know, so. Yeah, you said it killed them literally or just knocked them out? Killed. Yeah. So you had three dead guys there with you? And, uh, yeah, well, one guy died there on the spot. Mm -hmm. Another guy made it to the door. And the other guy made it about halfway to 326 Madden. Mm -hmm. All right. So, what did you do at that point? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> I went, holy shit. What did I get myself into, you know? Because I was always lucky when I, you know, volunteered for something or just said, you know, yeah, okay, I'll go or mm -hmm. whatever. I, it always turned out my way, but this time, you know, I was going, oh, man, you know. Yeah, it was a real shocker. I, yeah, I thought, holy shit. I mean, did you go and report it to the company sergeant, or...? I didn't have to. It happened around everybody else. Oh, okay. So there's a larger group of guys all there together. It's a whole platoon. Okay. So, you know, and then the CEO says, I got to write home to these people's parents. Mm -hmm. They didn't die in combat. Yeah. They died being morons. So, you know, there was a lot of that that went on. You know, so... 
All right. Uh, now, how long did the unit stay in the base camp before you went out and did anything? We'd stay probably uh, five to six days and then go back home. Okay, in those first few days after that sort of uh, unusual welcome you got, uh, did you just sit around and watch the other guys and try to figure out what was going on, or did, did people start talking to you? No, uh, you're shunned when you first come into the unit uh, until you make your bones. Mm -hmm. So, no, you know, nobody would talk to you or, you know, uh, show you how to pack your rucksack or give you any advice or, you know, you were an idiot mm -hmm. until you proved yourself. Right. Okay, so there's not, you know, there's not a platoon sergeant or anybody else who's giving you any direction or whatever. It's just there might be a, a, you know, a platoon sergeant or something to help you out a little, but you ain't going to bend over backwards. Okay. But pretty much basic level, just giving you the order, go do this, do that. Yeah, you know, one thing about Vietnam, if you lasted the first couple of weeks and through all the bullshit, you'd be all right. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now, what did they do? So the first time you actually go out and leave camp, with, was, do you go with a platoon or with a whole company or go to first patrol or mission? No, we, uh, I don't know if I should relate this story or not. Well, but I will, and you can cut it if okay. you want to. Uh, and the first mission that I went, went on was that episode I was talking about. Uh, a woman, we were in a pagoda, uh, had an OPL. A woman and her child were moving. Uh, it was dark. Uh, she was fired up, but the round didn't... Uh, turn enough to be activated. She was hit with that. So she's hit with an M79 grenade bomb, yeah. Right, which didn't activate. Didn't explode, yeah. And uh, the decision was made to uh, not report. And, uh, and the child was murdered also. So, you know, that kind of bothered me for all, you know, it still bothers me. Yeah. Uh, because basically this was about uh, personal careers. So, you know, I'm 19 years old and I don't know mm -hmm. anything. And we are just given a direct order to keep my mouth shut. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. So Now, was this a patrol that was just a foot patrol outside no, the base or had you flown ambush. somewhere? It was an ambush off down in Pagoda. Okay. So you had people on sort of this higher state of tension or alert and, and somebody yeah, shot the, the, how it happened it was the OP and the OP uh, okay it's the observation post hurt my yeah but I mean what but really bothers me is that woman was seen before I think a day before with mm -hmm. a child mm -hmm. and she wasn't uh, any threat I don't know what she was doing that close at night with the child mm -hmm. but that's Right. That's still a lot to digest, and it's still stuck with you. All right. Okay. Uh, now, does anything else happen on that patrol, or do you just go back to the base? Or not that I can recall. You know, I, I remember being real vague. The argument about whether or not to report it because mm -hmm. we had a uh, lieutenant that uh, was new, mm -hmm. and he wanted it reported, and. Uh, I, I just don't want to go on anymore. Right. Well, yeah. If someone else chooses to more elaborate more on it, it's oh, well, fine. Yeah, it's a point, basically, so you've had, in some ways, about as ugly an introduction to Vietnam as, as someone is likely to get, short of seeing your whole platoon shot up. Uh, you've seen a couple of pretty bad things that are not really what you're trained trained for. Uh, I guess it's your call. Yeah. You know, whatever. Uh, I'm just following orders. Mm -hmm. So are the Nazis too, you know. Yep. But I mean, you know, uh, I've saw a lot more atrocities the NBA did. So, mm -hmm. you know, does yep. that balance out? You know, I don't know. I mean, it's it, it, if there's a bigger lesson, it's more along the lines of just how bad war is in the first place, and what kinds of things it makes people do. It makes men insane. Yeah. All right. So, but you're, at this point, you're the 19-year-old kid just trying to function. Okay, so you go back from that patrol. What kinds of areas were you working in when you were first, so this is sort of the 
I guess we're making into early 1970 by this time. Um, uh, late 69. Yeah, December 69 is when you get out there and then uh, in, in 1970. What kind of area were you operating in initially? Um, triple canopy jungle. Okay. Now, were you going into the Asia Valley or uh, along uh, the edges of it? or? I, when I first got there in November, of uh, December, we were operating in the southern I Corps along Firebase Roy, or Roy, and then we moved uh, during uh, Randolph Glen. Uh, <clears throat> we started, you know, learning recon, reinforced recon tactics in that mission, and that was up in Quan Tree. And from there, we went to the Battle of, uh, well, into the offshore and Battle of Ripcord and through mm -hmm. that whole thing. All right. Uh, so the, explain a little bit the uh, reinforced recon concept. What are you learning to do when they send you up there to train? Uh, just moving at night, uh, trying to locate position activity. Um, usually, we, we always operated in, the, in platoon size elements. We're like your average recon unit, be five to you know twelve guys. Mm -hmm. uh, we usually had two M60s with us. Um, that was pretty much our, our operation. Okay. And about how large was the platoon? 30. Okay. 30 guys. All right. And then over the course of the time you're with them, do they manage to mostly keep that strength up, or does it vary a lot? You know, about the same strength. See, what we do is the, the CEO would, uh, <clears throat> you know, play a shell game. And uh, he was a very experienced at it. You know, he would put, uh, you know, two platoons out front, move them, and then he would be command and control mm -hmm. behind and hide. You know, he was really brilliant at it. And uh, so it worked really effectively well with him. All right. Now, the nature of uh, a reinforced recon mission, I mean, what were they sending him out to do? Uh, make, you know, not make contact, but no, you know, locate, uh, you know, uh, I remember one time, this was more towards the end, of the, it was, this was after a ripcord battle, but, uh, you know, we killed this courier, and, you know, they were swarming in there, and, uh, the kid, he was my age, I'll never forget it, he came over the top of the hill and at 60 cut him in half. Well, I blew, he blew, you know, from here to the edge of the river and he was out of training, man. I said, he went up to see if I could help him, you know, and uh, he was cut right in half. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when I looked at him, he died. <clears throat> and so you go into this shock, you know, and my one buddy who was always hacking people up, he started to come hack him up, I almost shot that far. But, you know, that's how brutal you get. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's just this brutality. And, uh, I'm pretty good now, I don't mm -hmm. <laughs> have it. I still have it, but it's way buried in mm -hmm. my subconscious, mm -hmm. you know. All right. Uh, what I'd like to do is try to kind of follow as best we can the course of your tour in, in Vietnam. So you, you started out, you had your initiation, if you will. Uh, do you remember the first time that you were actually in, in a regular combat situation with people shooting at you? Yes. It was after, uh, well, it was after that photograph. Uh, that was in April of... Uh, 1970. Mm -hmm. They went in with us. They had 33 killed and 200 wounded. It was a sapper company. With sappers are, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they're more or less the Green Berets of the NBA, you know. And, uh, so we went in there and uh, we moved in at night. And I was about that narrative I wrote. And, uh, we moved in at night. We weren't 50 meters from their position. And they were dug in, they had a 51, and uh, they could have annihilated it right then. But then the next day we walked into the ambush, you know. So, 
that was the, uh, they had 26 bunkers and, you know, they had uh, barbed wire all set up. And, you know, they, by all rights, they should have wiped us out. But what we did is during the battle, we re they were trying to come around and cut us off. Mm -hmm. And we regrouped enough to where we fought them off that way with the two machine guns and then pulled back and then finally got out. So the battle went on four days. No, no one covers that. Okay, let's try to lay out the context just a little bit better. So initially, another a whole, a whole a regular company had gone into that area and been cut up. Uh, and then was, was that near a particular fire base or position? It was close to fire. You, if you were on fire support base Catherine, you could see it. Okay. You could witness it. I have been in contact with some of the guys who were on artillery fire missions from mm -hmm. that. And when I ran out of ammunition and I couldn't hear, uh, and threw down the receiver, I told Lieutenant Schultz I was going for reinforcements. And at that time, they thought we were being overrun mm -hmm. and fired us up. Uh, there wasn't anybody killed, but uh, you know maybe it was that. They kept their heads down enough mm -hmm. for me to regroup so we could, you know, pull our people back and, and retreat. Otherwise, they would have wiped us out. All right. So you've got, so basically, so one, you had a company, did it air assault into the middle of trouble? Were they just going through the jungle and walking with ambush? Or well, the guys ahead of you, that is? In April 14th, I believe, right when the, the uh, Five O Deuce went to eight eighty two. We got uh, mortared all day. Mm -hmm. It was by the same, the same sabre. Right, right. And um, so when the, the O Deuce went in, um, they were beating the MVA, dug in and open battle. Mm -hmm. But they were getting killed at night on night ambushes, mm -hmm. you know, moving in. And um, there's a book that just uh, came out now. It's a uh, Araldo Leggero, who was a, he won a silver star with the, uh, uh, the old deuce during that battle, and he acknowledges our battle in the book, but anyway, mm -hmm. he said they got to the top of the hill and got socked in, and they were just picked off, mm -hmm. and they ended up with 33 killed and 200 wounded. And that's an a company at that point, it was a, was it a whole battalion together, or just one large company? That was, uh, I'm not sure. I think it was just the company, but uh, I have I have got Araldo's manuscript mm -hmm. at home, but I wouldn't feel comfortable right, giving right. it to you. Yeah. But I'm just it, the book is out now. Okay. I'm just trying to get a feel for the context of that, because at this point, usually a whole company was less than 200 men. Right. Most of the time, when they're in the field, sometimes they get rebuilt or built up, or they can be larger. Paper strength would be a lot bigger, but yeah. pretty much everybody in the company gets hit in one form or another. Then. Yeah. Yes. They. Uh, and they, they couldn't extract the wounded because mm -hmm. of the socked in weather that the right. helicopters couldn't come in. All right. And then your, basically your platoon went in, and what was your initial assignment? They had gone in first, they were getting in trouble. Locate the base. Okay. Uh, and then you, did you kind of walk right into the base complex, or? No, well, it was really funny how it happened. Uh, we went down four days, and the, no sign. And then we sent out a recon, and they had set up a three-man team ambush with RPGs waiting mm -hmm. for us to come up. Mm -hmm. Well, we had a scout dog that liked to run. So the guy let the dog go, and they had to blow it on the dog or else us, mm -hmm. you know. So one of the point men seen one of the NBA run down the finger of this hill. So then we buried the dog that night. And we made the decision to go down the hill, and when we did, mm -hmm. we walked right 50 meters, not from them, man. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I imagine they were up all night, too, going, holy shit. So they didn't open up on you? Pardon me? They just let you walk in? They Did, did they start shooting at you? Or? No, no. Okay. If they would have started shooting at night, it would have given away their position. Yeah. So they waited till the next day. Mm -hmm. So what we did is like we walked out mm -hmm. and they walked us right into an L-shaped. Mm -hmm. So they had us there and they had us this mm -hmm. way. So we were right in the center of the kill zone and they were just blowing us all the shit. 
then uh, there was miraculous. There was no one killed on that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. Now, it's maybe some of the logic of having you do your patrols platoon size with a little bit more firepower is they were aware that there are enough NVA out there, but right. the smaller units just might not be able to get out. Yeah, I see. There was thirty-five bunkers. Mm -hmm. So that's two men to a bunker. Yeah. Man, we were outnumbered, dude, and um, we were thirty guys. Yeah, and, and you're in the open, <laughs> and they're not. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and to top it off, so my commander, who was excellent, uh, Captain uh, Terry Mills, uh, he, right after it all happened, right after, so they hit us with our own napalm. Mm -hmm. Cause we were so close, and so after we had all of our napalm injuries, medevac and everything, he says assault their position. Well, at that time, everybody's nerves are gone, you know, and by us moving in so fast, they had uh, uh, probably 200 mortars all lined up with an electrical wire mm -hmm. leading up into the bushes, but they didn't have time to set it up because we moved in so fast. That would have wiped us all out. So, in this case, the order to attack right away, which sounds crazy, crazy, actually worked. It actually worked brilliantly. You know, I mean, because he didn't have time to put that fuse together because mm -hmm. he heard us coming. But uh, to this day, I don't know how I'm summoned enough uh, guts to. After you know eight hours of going through all that, you know. But. Yeah. Now, when you're out there in, in the field like that, uh, for an extended period of time, because you'd been out for several days at that point, um, had you gotten any resupply or any water or anything like that, or? Yeah, right bef before the battle, uh, mm -hmm. we were getting resupply, okay. and they said, "Pop smoke." I think uh, Nolan covers it in his mm -hmm. book. So the gooks. Uh, yeah. Popped the same smoke we did. So, you know, he kicked it all out to them, including our M60 and M60 barrels, mm -hmm. plus all the ammunition. Okay. That is, so were you, were you short stuff when you went in then? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, we were. And then about probably uh, 45 minutes later, we heard that M60 working out. <laughs> You have to hand it to the NBA. They were brilliant mm -hmm. in, in a lot of ways, and uh, I never lost respect for fighting the fighting their army. Mm -hmm. uh, if you did, that's uh, that would be your fault. Yeah. Now, basically, was most of your tour kind of spent on a series of these sorts of recon patrols going in and out of the jungle, or is that a fairly regular thing, or does it change over time what you're doing? It never really changed. We always uh, use the same tactics, uh, moving at night, uh, reinforced recon, uh, you know, elements. Mm -hmm. Now, you're operating largely in jungle areas at this point? Yeah, triple canopy, yeah. Okay. Now, had parts of it been defoliated or hit with Agent Orange, or not much? Not much. We're, we were operating mostly in uh, uh, along the edge of the border between uh, around Ripcord, mm -hmm. around Catherine, mm -hmm. uh, Vagel. Uh, so kind of along the length of kind of the Asia there in, in the hills outside. Yeah, of more, it, yeah it was mostly the uh, eastern side, yeah. Elephant Valley, mm -hmm. uh, and around there. All right. Now, when you doing your recon function, of, were you looking for, for movements of enemy troops or were you looking for fixed positions or caches or...? Any kind of contact activity. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Anything out of the, that we'd see, you know, whatever. Okay. Now, would you find um, sometimes empty bunker complexes or... or Places where they hidden away supplies or things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember the one time that we went after the guy who was the Caucasian. We went after him once. He, he was—I uh, don't know if you read it in the book or he was uh, supposedly carrying an M60 um, with the NBA. But there was a lot of Eastern Bloc uh, 
advisors, mm -hmm. Cubans. Yeah. And did you ever see any uh, of those or just hear about them? No, I just heard about yeah. them. Now, how much did you ever actually see the NVA? Uh, very, so they were extremely disciplined. Um, I think that is one of the facades that they still like to use. Mm -hmm. uh, if you studied their history, going back to the Chinese and Genghis Khan, they use the same strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know why someone such as brilliant uh, McNamara ever read a book, but uh, it would seem like he would say, oh, that makes sense. They're dug underneath Bob Hope having a party. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, uh, they were using the caves back, I think, in Genghis Khan. Mm -hmm. You know, caves and they'd use tunnels and things against the French the whole time. And, oh, the whole time. Yeah. Yes. And so, and the thing is, we, we knew that. Right. Yeah, and they're doing it anyway. I thought it was funny because I was going to go back a couple of years ago and I would like to go back where I fought. But, uh, they're not too keen on that because that's where most of their tunnels are. Mm -hmm. You know, and some of their probably classified uh, supply areas. So, so they're worried we might still come back. Us or anybody <laughs> else? You know, yeah. I don't think the Chinese know where the cave is. And I thought what was so funny is after we ended the war, the Chinese tried it again. Mm -hmm and didn't make it. Yeah. So. All right. Um, now, was there sort of a regular rhythm or pattern to what you were doing on your tour? For instance, when you went out on a patrol in the jungle someplace, how many days in a row would you stay out? Uh, it all depend on the mission, maybe seven to 30 days. Okay. Uh, not the whole time. What we do is like after 30 days, they give us a break, depending on the commander. Mm -hmm. uh, to support a fire base, artillery fire base. Some commanders didn't like it, you know, and they would turn it down. So then you'd stay out in the field again. But, uh, mm -hmm. And what reasons would they have to stay out of the fire bases? Uh, the work, the BS, or else they wanted to, you know, uh, do something for their career. Mm -hmm. You know, they wanted a body count. Yeah, or, body count. You know, they want to engage the enemy and have right. action, which you won't have if you're on the base. And yeah. uh, they come there. Now, uh, when you're out in the field on the patrol and that kind of thing, um, how well disciplined were the men in the platoon in terms of. Depending the, on the contact, uh, extremely disciplined and. Uh, you know, focused on the job. Uh, if we if we were in heavy contact, mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't uh, wouldn't hesitate to go back to war with any one of these guys. Okay. So, when you're particularly when you're marching at night, what kinds of things do you have to do to, to function effectively or keep yourself safe? Keep uh, everything taped down. No metal contact. Grab the guy in front of you. Sit on. You know where you're going. Mm -hmm. I mean, how can you can, could you even see where you were going? You couldn't see. It'd be the point man, and then you just grab the guy in front of you. All right. And how would the point man know where he was going? Well, I mean, I, I don't know. If they ask him, well, you'd have it. See what my CO used to do, and it worked every time as a shell game. He'd send out three recons in each direction mm -hmm. because the NBA always had trail watchers. Mm -hmm. They'd watch where you're going. So they didn't know where exactly where he'd be at. So every time it worked, you know. Okay. So you were moving on the trails when you were moving at night? Mm-hmm. Okay. Now were there problems with ambushes or booby traps on the trails? Uh, yeah. Yeah. You'd have to keep an eye out for that point, man. We had a few numerous fatalities. But, uh, yeah, but uh, lost a lot of. I remember that. Mm -hmm. All right. Now at night, then, so you, you would not cut through the jungle directly, or would you? No. Okay. No. Did you do that during the day sometimes? So. Okay. Um, so. You, know, you just make too much noise. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, but the, I guess the, that is sort of one of the sort of standard things people will often talk about, whether or not their particular company or battalion or command or whatever wanted them to be on the trails or off the trails. Mm -hmm. And some stayed off the trails most of the time just because they wanted to stay out of the problems, and others would use them because that's how you could move quickly. Well, that's true, but uh, I remember one time we were, we were in the Osho Valley and we came to a Y. We were walking down a uh, riverbed. There's a high ground up here. So all of a sudden the CO's looking at the map or something and trying to figure out which way to go, and we start hearing thump, thump, thump like grenades. Mm -hmm. And somebody hollered grenades. Only it wasn't grenades, it was the rock apes. Mm -hmm. And they were the only <laughs> They were in line, mm -hmm. had the high ground, and were beaning people. Mm -hmm. I mean, one guy had to get mad of that because he got it thwacked upside the head. We were in their territory. Mm -hmm. But see, it wouldn't have been so bad if they were just throwing rocks, but they were throwing shit too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so that it, in other words, get out of here. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm sure they did it to the NBA. But you ain't got no business here. Leave. All right. So you have not just the NBA to worry about. You've got rock apes as well. Uh, They're about that tall and uh, husky dudes. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, what other kinds of wildlife create trouble for you, large or small? Uh, there. Is, you're talking about the Burmese jungle. Well, uh, tigers. I never witnessed one eating a guy, but uh, they were there. Could you hear them at night sometimes? No, no, you never hear, hear one. I, okay. I've seen them in the daylight. Mm -hmm. You know, they were it was well fed over there. Yeah, I so, expect. Uh, uh, did you have a lot of problems with insects or parasites or things yeah, like that? Yeah, there's uh, extremely poisonous snakes. and You know, it's the Burmese jungle. Mm -hmm. So, and that was another thing too. It was like fighting in the Garden of Eden. Um, it was just an, an amazing place. I mean, at night, the fox paths would come on and they would turn the sky black. You know, but, uh, I had read where the Vietnamese had turned uh, the Osho Valley into a national preserve, and they should, because mm -hmm. it's just amazing wildlife there. Yeah. I think some of it may even have been officially park land back when it was in South Vietnam, or some of that area was. Oh, yeah. Because there was not a whole lot, there wasn't really civilian population in most of those places. Yeah, it's inhabitable. You can't live there. Uh, the ground leeches are just horrible. Uh, you can sit down on a break and hear them coming at you, you know, through the leaves. And uh, it's just, that's why people don't live there. Yeah. Now, how common was it for the men in, the, in, in your platoon to get various kinds of sort of infections, whether it's the jungle rot or right. other kinds of diseases and things? The, if left alone, the jungle will kill you in itself just because of that. I developed cellulitis, a lot of the guys did. It's like giant boils. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, if I'm treated, it would kill you. You yeah. end up with blood poisoning or something. Now, how do they treat that? I think sulfur drugs. Okay, so penicillin or something. Yeah. But you know, that's where all of the SARS came originated. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, it's like the basic <laughs> breeding ground it's for germs. It's not as bad as Ebola, man, but I mean, where yeah. do you think all that stuff originates? Like, dengue fever, I was reading on that, and it just jumped from um, apes 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. Have you read how bad that stuff is? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and now it's in Belize. Somehow it, it jumped over to Belize. You know, yeah. Yeah. from what I've read, if you live the first attack, you're okay. Mm -hmm. and the second one, is, you, that kills you. So. Okay. Now, uh, so at any given time, do you have a certain number of guys who have to be sent back to base camp to be treated or uh, that kind of thing? Was that a, or did they do most of the treatment just out there in the field or? Treatment, how? Oh. Well, for various kinds, if you, if you get diseases or infections or that kind of thing. No, if you develop some kind of serious uh, blood disorder or, or you know, skin disorder, you went back to, to the rear if, if you couldn't operate. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now, 
there are I asked a little bit about sort of you know, morale within the unit. Now, when you're platoon, when you go back to a base camp, whether a fire base or occasionally one farther to the rear, um, does that change how the men act? Not until after heroin. Before heroin, uh, everybody get drunk or smoke pot. Mm -hmm. There was no, uh, you know, uh, with the alcohol. The upper echelon would rather they would rather have people smoke pot than drink beer because beer you're going to fight somebody. Mm -hmm. And so that was going on after heroin. It was uh, a whole bunch of shit, racial problems, um, all kinds of stuff. Now, when did you notice the heroin having an effect? Right, exactly when uh, Nolan mentioned it in August of '70. Because mm -hmm. I went on R&R, &R and, R. and I, I had been there in July, it was, you know, nothing, no problems. Mm -hmm. When I came back to go to Da Nang, that's all I seen was heroin. And, you know, and the argument, the racial problems, mm -hmm. you know, and all that, all that stuff, and I just uh, avoided it, man. Okay. Yeah. So basically, so before the advent of the heroin, I mean, was there a certain level of racial tension in the units that you saw, or not particularly? Yeah, but it was isolated. Okay. You're going to have them guys anyway, mm -hmm. you know, uh, rednecks and, and blacks, or certain mm -hmm. blacks, you know, but it wasn't as, uh, pro as profound as it was after they started doing heroin. And, uh, okay. Now, does the heroin follow you back out into the field, or are the guys who are using no, it pretty much stay back? You can't. You can never do that in the field. Never. Uh, even though we'd find it in the MBA, uh, it wasn't really heroin, it was opium mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of marijuana. But, uh, you know, I don't consider that a drug, so. Yeah. But it's the sort of thing, but there was. But even once heroin arrives, there's people are still policing themselves well enough that they're not doing that stuff when they're out in the bush someplace. Oh yeah, yeah I mean it'd be like uh, somebody showing up drunk. Mm -hmm. You want somebody showing up drunk, you know? You're gonna off the guy or uh, get rid of him or something, you know? All right. Uh, now, in the units that you were with, were there? Did you ever see or hear anything about uh, fraggings of officers or sergeants or anything like that? No, not in, I was in the, in the field most of my tour. I never, except for when I had the, that month with the cellulitis, and I never saw, witnessed anything like that. Mm -hmm. All right. At what point did you get the cellulitis badly enough you had to go back? Um, February of seventy. Okay. So it hadn't really the combat hadn't really hit. Um, okay. Yeah. So you hadn't seen a lot of that, but you're back. And then where do they send you when you're sick? Uh, 326, man. Back to my unit, Fubai, okay. Camp Eagle. All right. So you're on Camp Eagle. And then what was life on Camp Eagle like while you were staying there? You got a certain amount of guys who don't want to go back out, who are going to run and hide. Mm -hmm. And, you know, try to avoid top. Make sure you don't see, oh, shit, here he comes, mm -hmm. you know. And if you miss your bird, then, okay, it's tomorrow you be at the pad, mm -hmm. you know, but that kind of stuff. But, you know, like as you mentioned, and a lot of people have mentioned this before, there wasn't really any, you know, uh, race problems or any mm -hmm. kind of stuff like that until after era. Okay. All right. Now, when you went on R&R, &R, where did you go? Sydney. Okay. And now, did you pick that, or was that was available at the time? No, I, I picked Sydney. I got there right when the uh, opera house was completed. Mm-hmm. What was it like to go to a place like Australia in the middle of a, if you bid the better part of a half a year or so in Vietnam? Man, culture shock. I, I never knew that I, I would get that, you know, I never realized it, but wow, well, it's like heaven, it's something else. And how did the Australians treat the American soldiers? Great, great, they really were good to us, you can just ask them about everyone. You know, real good to us. Yeah. And then how hard was it to get onto a plane to go back? Son of a bitch. Because I still had a couple months to do. Mm -hmm. And I knew I was going back. You know, the ripcord was sort of winding down, but you still had, you know, two and a half divisions, the NBA in the area. Too, right. So. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the Senate, I guess your, your unit was kind of involved in the operation at different times, but not really so much in the central part of it. Uh, no, because there was not a that I can recall, because we were moved around so much. Mm -hmm. now, I remember that one time, it, it really stuck in my mind, it was, uh, it might have not been the, the day the helicopter crashed in the ammo dump, but man, there was a great big boom, mm -hmm. and we felt it out in the jungle. And, and it was, what, yeah, was well there was a, yeah, well a helicopter had crashed on top of yeah, Fire base ripcord, and, yeah, and it was carrying artillery ammunition, and it blew up the whole 105 millimeter battery. Uh, so yeah, a spectacular explosion there. I still can't see how those guys, anybody, wasn't killed on that. Uh, it's unreal. Well, it was a well-built base. Yeah, Vasquez did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he did a great job. I wrote him the other day on Facebook. I said thanks. All right. Uh, how much? When you're out there, so you're you're basically your unit is operating various kinds of patrols in the area, kind of northern end of the A shot, or kind of around where the court was. Do you have any idea of what was going on in the larger war at that point? Or? No, absolutely okay. not. Uh, while you were there over the course of that year, did you have any sense of how the larger war was going? Absolutely not. All right. At this point, this tape is not done. At the beginning, the the guys who were taking pills and stuff were they? Do you think they're actually eating malaria pills? The guys who got drunk or Maybe something else. Who passed away? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, they knew what, what they were eating. I heard him say that he got them from uh, the medic's bag. Okay. Now, did you take malaria drugs yourself? Not after this incident. I refused. Okay. Did you ever get malaria? No, I was lucky there. Mm -hmm. So it may have, I, maybe there's less of it up in the hills than there is down by the coast or something. I don't uh, know. No, I think it's quite. Uh, it's all over it. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know what the odds are, you know, to contract it. But uh, um, after that incident, I never, never took another. Didn't want to do that. All right. Uh, now, the we had been talking some about sort of the the sort of the ripcord operation. It was a major campaign, officially called Operation Texas Star, that went on kind of April into August, through August or whatever, 1970. Uh, yeah, it was uh, uh, the 6th of April to September 5th, I yeah. believe. Yeah, yeah. And was that the period then of the most activity for you, or did it stay on afterwards, because you're there? I would you know, say the buildup started in um, March, April, mm -hmm. and went on until September and after, uh, after that. Okay, so after that, your unit, are you still going into some of the same areas, or are you operating now farther east? The last operation I remember I was on was on, uh, right before uh, October. I went home on 3 October 70, mm -hmm. but we were in support of the uh, Arvin 1st Division, and uh, the blew up instant LZ and Laos somewhere, and I can't, mm -hmm. and we supported that for two weeks, and that was the last operation that I was on. All right. Now, did your unit actually get into Laos, or were you staying back inside South Vietnam? I couldn't really give you the grid coordinates, mm -hmm. but I know we were right there, and whatever operation the Arvins were conducting, we were in support. Mm -hmm. And in effect, what what does that mean if you're in support? I believe, well, we were in artillery. We were, okay. We were uh, uh, protecting the artillery unit that was, I think it was 155. Mm -hmm. All right. So you may well have been just inside South Vietnam and firing into Laos at that point. They were sometimes careful about that. Yeah, uh, for the most part, it didn't really matter. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now, when you think back to the time that you spent in, in Vietnam, and is that, uh, are there other particular incidents that stand out in, in your memory that you haven't uh, brought into the story here yet? I think one of the most dramatic was uh, the Battle of Hill, uh, Hill 82 and 714, along with the uh, 502nd Infantry. Uh, that battle lasted from April until 1 June. Um, the 502nd Infantry never really had uh, a historical explanation of what happened uh, to their unit. Uh, 
they defeated quite a lot of them. I mean, open battle. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there hasn't really been a full explanation of uh, their sacrifices mm -hmm. up until uh, around the Lucero's book, which was recently published. Um, but anyway, that was the beginning, I, I think, uh, of the higher-ups realizing that this was developing into a major situation. Mm -hmm. I think uh, right after the Battle of 882, we were on a recon going into uh, the Firebase Cannon, which was at that particular time abandoned. And at night, it would, at night it was quite obvious MBA spotted trail moving in. Uh, why there was nothing done about that as far as calling an artillery mm -hmm. or uh, air attacks or whatever. Uh, it was my view is that they were allowing them to move in uh, to uh, uh, have, a, have a battle, mm -hmm. you know, to, to see to what extent they were going to move in the area. But, uh, I don't think, uh, I think the 100, 101st underestimated the NBA commitment and uh, didn't find out about it until it was too late. Plus the fact that uh, I don't think we had the necessary uh, uh, manpower mm -hmm. to bring a uh, uh, major battle to, uh, to, you know, to the forefront. So there in a way they may be operating following the same line of thinking they might have a year earlier when there were more men and more units available draw an enemy unit into a fight or maybe the end weren't as many enemy coming in or something yeah I, it, it, you know I'm second guessing yeah, yeah. you know just as, as a, a private or PFC but I mean that being on the ground seeing a witness after the fact because at that time I didn't know what mm -hmm. was going on um, I, th I think that's what what the case was. But then when they realized the extent, then it was, uh, you know, it changed. Uh, we went from the, uh, you know, initiative to, to a defensive posture, mm -hmm. which we never got rid of. You know, uh, I mean, we remained in a d defensive posture till the end of that uh, tactical withdrawal. Okay, so you have that whole about a month out there in the field with repeated contact and you're always having, so you're not able to go out and really do as much of the more aggressive reconnaissance work. Well, you know, it's, it's one thing when, when you have faced NBA battle and they will fight just uh, enough to make contact and then retreat mm -hmm. to they stood and fought, mm -hmm. and in particular in the Battle of 882, yeah. when uh, personally I was eating dirt for in between airstrikes, mm -hmm. and uh, the NVA would wait to the last second and then stand man to man on line, shooting in the air. Now that takes iron balls, so I knew that these people were definitely committed. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really, uh, you know, gave me respect for the NBA that I never lost. So, I, uh, anyone who underestimated the Vietnamese, especially the NBA Army, mm -hmm. uh, they were behind the eight ball there. Mm -hmm. so, never. But uh, like anyone, I get excited talking about it because it's still, still right fresh in my memory. Mm -hmm. well, it's part of why we record the stories. <laughs> you know, I do that, but it's uh, yeah, because the you know today you know today I mean most the people who actually serve in the military is a relatively small chunk of the population, right. and we keep recycling the same people through the war zones that we have had. And so it stays a fairly small chunk of the population. For most others, they don't have any awareness at all of what this can possibly be like. Yes, yeah, so, you know, because it really struck me. This is who I'm fighting. These people are standing up in a wall of fire with AK-47. So they're, they're trying to shoot at the aircraft? Trying or? to bring down a Phantom jet. Yeah. Now, 
<laughs> that's insane. Yeah. So then uh, that's when I realized that uh, I better rethink, you know, this whole mm -hmm. thing here. But uh, I, I never lost respect. Right. And I think when you lose respect for your enemy is when you uh, you get too overconfident. Get, get in trouble. That's right. Now, when you're out in the field, are you normally just carrying an M16, or do you have other jobs? Uh, I carry the uh, machine gun, the M16, thump gun. I pretty much ran, you know, ran the ramp on uh, light weapons. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you didn't get, you didn't carry a radio or no. Okay, so didn't do that part. I preferred uh, protecting the gun. Mm -hmm. All right. In general, how effective was sort of the air or artillery support you called in? I mean, could you get it? Superb. Oh. Uh, the NBA had a tactic where uh, they would try to get as close as they could to you to negate your air power mm -hmm. or artillery, and uh, that's when you called it in on yourself. Mm -hmm. and, we used to do that on numerous occasions. Have to. Mm -hmm. And so you did have the one incident where some of your own guys got hit with some of the napalm. But Unfortunately. Well, no, that was, uh, that's still classified, that whole mm -hmm. thing. Uh, there's a question of if, if that was a friendly fire or not. Mm -hmm. uh, Nolan says it hit both positions. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll go by that. Yeah. Well, I don't know that the other guys had napalm. No, they didn't have <laughs> But they could have made it. They, as smart as they yep. were, they would have been down in there in jars. They're going to get these guys. Mm -hmm. But yeah. uh, no, I, uh, if it was uh, unclassified, I would think that, uh, I don't know how they would classify it. Mm -hmm. well, regardless of most of the time, you could when you put when you called in support, you would get it quickly and accurately, or was that depending on your uh, FO? Uh, mm -hmm. And for the most part, these guys were phenomenal. They would call it right in on you. Um, yeah, that mm -hmm. saved us many, many times. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, as once you got back from the R and R, you're getting into the last, you know, month or so of your time in the field. Are you counting down the days that you're left, or are you not trying not to think about it? Yeah. Uh, you went through a depression period. People got remorseful. You know, you could see it. You, uh, you knew it was coming. Everybody uh, experienced it mm -hmm. to a certain extent. I had one friend. Uh, a buddy of mine that refused to uh, carry a weapon this last month. And uh, he went to the CO and said, I'm done. And it wasn't that he hadn't proved himself in battle, he was sick of it. Mm -hmm. And the CO said, fine, carry a walking stick. So that's what he did, and we covered him because we had respect for him. We knew he wasn't a conscientious objector. Mm -hmm. He just got to the point where he made up his mind. Right. Uh, now, over the course of your year, you would have seen pretty much the entire population of your platoon turn over uh, one or more times between just rotation and casualties and stuff. Uh, as things went, was there a certain group of guys that you kind of became friends with or got close to, or yeah. how does that work? I'm still, I just got back from visiting my uh, M60 uh, gunner. Mm -hmm. You know, it would be the guys who came in about the same time that you did, that you grouped with? Right. Yeah. yeah. All right. Same. But then toward the end, are sort of most of the guys that you knew already gone? Yeah, it was kind of like, you know, friends leaving and then you felt naked and, uh, you know, what do I do? To, you know, it's, it's a natural process. Right. Now, did you make any effort to help the new guys when they came in? When I was first came in, no, you had to make your bones. Right. No one would speak with you. No one would talk to you. So I'm sitting there to myself and I'm packing up my rucksack, which looks like hell. And so I'm packing it up and I'm thinking to myself, I will never ever treat anyone as badly as I've been treated here. And all of a sudden, some guy walks by me and drops 300 rounds M60 ammo. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't say nothing. You can't say nothing. Because if you, you know, 
So I didn't say I packed it up and I said, I'll never do that. I, well, I hope I find out who that is. I'm going to let him have it, you know. So <clears throat> we go out on the mission, come back, and we get a new guy. And guess what? He's back, and I know he's thinking the same thing mm -hmm. I would. I walked by and had 300 rounds. <laughs> <laughs> But the guy who dropped 300 rounds on me is who I just got back visiting. Mm -hmm. So every time I tell him, I'm going to get you for that. All right. Now, uh, what sort of guys did they have uh, as sergeants or non-coms in your unit did you have? Were they shake and bake sergeants or were they guys who had some Some experience? shake and bakes, which, which uh, you know, I heard a lot of people knock shake and bakes, but uh, they did a job. Mm -hmm. And they fulfilled the job really good. I've seen some shake and bakes that were better than, you know, people that come up to that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but uh, we had, it was mixed. Yeah, it was mixed. All right. And did the sergeants and, and the lieutenants, I mean, did they provide reasonably good leadership most of the time? Or did that vary just from man to man? Uh, I would say 90% of uh, were great. You'd always run across that uh, that one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, when a new officer or a new sergeant comes into the unit, uh, was there a way of breaking them in, or did they observe first and act later, or would they just try to take over? They would kind of just look around and see what needs to be, you know, hatcheted, mm -hmm. or who needs to be cut, and who, uh, you know, get rid of the troublemakers or whatever. You know, that kind of upper management stuff. Mm -hmm. So, But they didn't walk in and just assume like they knew everything and you didn't? It all depends on your personality, you know. Mm -hmm. If they did, you'd say, yeah, sure. Yeah. All right. All right, so you get... Now, did they? Did you get to go home a little bit early from your tour? Oh. Uh, you said you left in October? Yeah, I got a 10-day drop. I think something like that. All right. Now, at that point, so this is sort of October 1970, you've still got some time left uh, on your enlistment. Right. Um, what do they, what do you do, at, well, I guess, well, it's before we actually get there. Um, are you figuring, okay, you're going to have to have duty on a base in the States for a while, or? I had 52 days to extend in the OSHA, and my number was up, and uh, so I just chose to do six months in here in Vietnam, or, um, I mean, the uh, United States. Okay. Uh, now, how long? I guess how long do you actually did you stay out in the field until right before you left, or did you get some time in the base camp first? Or I got a week uh, in Fubai before mm -hmm. I got on my bird. All right. And how do they manage the departure? Is it just show up every day and find out if your name's on a list? Yeah. All right. And what did you do in Fubai while you were waiting? Mm, just hung out. You know, everybody was going crazy on heroin at that mm -hmm. time. It was, uh, it, it was dangerous. So did you just kind of keep quiet and keep it yourself? And... Yep. All right. Now, uh, how did they get you back to the States? Flew. Flew back. Back. It was another charter commercial flight? Yeah. All right. And what was the atmosphere like on the plane? Depressing, real depressing, uh, because then you go through culture shock in your own here in your own country. And I, I had a real problem with that. But while you were still, when you were first on the, when you first, guys first got on the plane, was there a sense of relief, or you're happy you're getting out? Or? Oh yeah, great, great applause. But you know, but then there's that underlying fear. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a changed person now. Uh, how are people going to accept me? Uh, mm -hmm. What's going to happen? Am I going to turn into a bank robber or a murderer? Or, you, know, you don't know what the fuck happened to you. Yeah. Uh, before you came back, uh, how much did you know about anti-war movement or what was going on back in the States? I was indifferent about it. Mm -hmm. I was indifferent about it over there. I'm just doing my job. I didn't appreciate, you know, some of the media stuff. Mm -hmm. But hey, uh, it was day to day for me. Okay. And where do you land when you get back to the States? Uh, Flint. Oh, but I mean, you land somewhere in the West Coast first, right? Oh, uh, 
Fort Lewis. Okay. Jimmy Hendrix is playing the Star Spangled Banner. And, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. Now, sometimes when people came back, uh, and then, now were, you go, were, you, were you going, did you get leave home at that point when you got back? Yeah, I got 30 days. All right. Now, some of the guys talked about, you know, changing out of their uniforms at the airport or anything like I that. I threw it all away. Okay. So you're just going out in civilian clothing at that point? Yep. Okay. And did you see any yeah, there were protesters at the airport? No, nobody like spit on me or nothing like yeah. that. Okay. I mean, didn't witness anything like that. I just had a lot of anger. Mm -hmm. And then how did you spend your leave home? Well, I got drunk. My best friend picked me up and went to a Civic Park bar in town. Tom was fucked up in the head. Mm -hmm. I didn't really know. He was a quartermaster in Saigon. And, uh, walked in the Civic Park bar and uh, was shooting pool and stuff and all of a sudden <clears throat> the bartender says, hey, you can't do that. And this idiot's pissing in a pool pocket. Broad daylight. And I'm not kidding you. And I said, what is wrong with you? Mm -hmm. They can all kiss my ass. You know, that kind of stuff. And it just kind of hit home, man. You aren't right here, mm -hmm. you know? So, and he was the guy who was in Saigon. Yeah. You know, you were out there stomping around in the bush, and he's pissing in the pool pocket. Okay. <laughs> I didn't ask him why he did it. I didn't ask the ranch at all. I just get away from me, dude. All right. So was it kind of a relief to go off to an army base for a while after that? Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. Where did they send you? What base did you serve on? No, oh, back to Fort Knox. Okay. And what did they have you do there? Charging hills with blank guns. Okay, so you were helping with the drill instructors and yeah, then and you know on tank maneuvers. Mm -hmm. It's the tank uh, yeah school, so right. you, were, you were assigned to them and at night. Everybody get blasted, drunk on Mad Dog or whatever they were drinking. Mm -hmm. Then the fights would commence, and then you'd see guys the next day say, I'm sorry, man, I didn't mean to hit you. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of stuff. All right. Uh, now, did anyone at any point uh, make any effort to encourage you to re enlist? Yes, they did, as a matter of fact. They didn't do that until after I got discharged. Mm -hmm. I was uh, <clears throat> working on Buick's Railroad, and they called me up. Why don't we come back in? So here I, I come out, E2. Mm -hmm. That's mosquito wings, dude. Yeah. I got busted once for being in a whorehouse and way. Mm -hmm. And then I got busted for uh, the threatening this other guy's life, which it was all BS. And so then they called me up and said, We're going to make you a first sergeant, or not a first sergeant, but a sergeant yeah. right now. Mm -hmm. Come on back in. I'm working at Buick Railroad as a switch guy, you know. Uh, the, you mentioned being in a whorehouse in, in a way. Was that during that period when you were back at the hospital and were killing time or? We'd come out of the jungle. Okay. So you, you sometimes when you got back in the jungle for a while, they could turn you loose for a while. Yeah, well they did. But see, the 101st, it was off, the way was off limits. Mm-hmm. But the Marines could come and go. Yeah. You know, and we resented the piss out of that. So a couple of my buddies says, hell, let's just go into way scare this shit. Mm -hmm. So who gets busted? Yeah. So. <laughs> and did you at least get into a fight with Marines first, or did an MP no. just spot you in the wrong place? And I didn't even get a piece either, because they were already there, and so it was freeze. <clears throat> so that's what my commander says, I hate taking this right, but you know, mm -hmm. you're a good soldier, but I got to do this. And yeah, because on the whole, you did you not have a lot of contact with civilians because just no, because of where you were operating? We were, they wanted us separated mm -hmm. from the civilians. Uh, they kind of look at Vietnamization as that have the Marines go in there, work in the field, yeah, right. and then, you know, 
what do they call it? Uh, they had civic action patrols or something like that. Some, it, it's in the report, I yeah. think, what the strategy is. Mm -hmm. And all he says in there is working great. Yeah. It's, you know, all this glowing shit. Mm -hmm. So all, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Now, when, within your units, did you have Kit Carson scouts or any Vietnamese? What were they like? Uh, mostly spies. Uh, we had one in our unit uh, that he, he was captured during the battle of Wei. Mm -hmm. He wasn't a spy. He was 19. He was my age. And he got malaria and, and they uh, moved him down to uh, uh, Big Kong and uh, then he went back to uh, Phu Bai and then he got conscripted in, in the Chu Hoi program. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't, uh, he wasn't every day. Yeah. So. Did any of these guys do you any good? Tang was kind of dumb. He was like me. I mean, you know, you're just caught up in, mm -hmm. you don't know what the fuck is going on, yeah. really. And, but we had this one old man, he was a spy, and the, the, old, uh, the CO would, the guy would say, turn left, he'd turn right. And, uh, and I seen that guy selling heroin, too. Mm -hmm. So I, that really clued me in, mm -hmm. yeah. But. All right. So now you get you get to the end of your hitch. You come out. So you just went back and just went back to to work for Buick again, or yeah. And my it's weird because I, you know I kind of went crazy there for a couple of years, just doing wild ass shit. And then uh, her daughter got hit by this car. Flipped me off. That's my PTSD hit. Because mm -hmm. you know it was like Dr. Chamberlain said. You know it was laying, you know, dormant until there was just a, uh, you know, trigger, mm -hmm. life trigger to trigger all this shit. Mm -hmm. and so then, you know, from there it was down, you know. So that was in '76. So. And, and, then, and then whose daughter was hit? It was my, uh, I went to uh, high school with Mary and it was her daughter and I was babysitting. But man, I went down there and there was blood all over the street and it mm -hmm. just, uh, just like numb, you know. Yeah. And all the trauma and the people, the adrenaline and, you mm -hmm. know. So. It's all back. Now at that point, I mean, was there, I mean, they hadn't even recognized her PTSD as a, as a condition or anything at that point. No, they said it was a personality disorder. They're still using that. Mm -hmm. So have you not been recognized by the VA as having a PTSD or are they... <clears throat> no, they, uh, I got recognized, uh, compensated mm -hmm. 15 years ago. Okay. All right. Um, now, over the course of time, do you get have you got involved at all with any kind of veterans groups or? Yeah, I'm still I still go to outpatient. Um, yeah, I uh, it's really it's how PTSD affects you is like a, a lot of guys you see come out and they say, oh, well, I'm just going to fucking bury the guy. Mm -hmm. You're down to the VFW hall and sit there and have beer. Well, when your life has changed, uh, it don't matter how many beers you drink. Mm -hmm. If you're going to drink beer, it's going to make it worse down the road, you know, because, you know, then you really start having problems mm -hmm. with it. You know, and what did they call it in the Civil War? You know, a soldier's heart. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. If, you know, it's, it's, it became shell shock. It became combat fatigue in right. World War II. And, but you know, I, I'm sure you're going to talk to General Harrison. I am. Oh, he's a great guy. Yeah. Uh, excellent man. But you know who he reminds me of is the hero of uh, Gettysburg, Chamberlain, mm -hmm. Joshua Chamberlain, mm -hmm. because he cares about his troops, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what T Chamberlain did. Yeah. You know, I mean, he actually gives a shit. Yeah. Well, he was. He started out as an enlisted man. Right. And actually, I mean, I interviewed a number of the, the officers out of that group, the higher ones, I mean, so him and, and Captain Vasquez and Fred Spaulding. Yeah. And all three of those guys. Amazing. Know, they, they, and they are incredible people. They all, they all went up through the ranks. I know, and they're fucking amazing. Yeah. Amazing people. I would, I, I'd love to fight under, the, under yeah. those guys, you know. 
And, and one of the central things was, I mean, they were concerned about keeping the men alive and, Absolutely. and, and yeah. looking after them and making sure that they were able to accomplish what they were supposed to. Another do. thing about that book and I question, and I know you're not supposed to you know, question sure, an yeah. officer, but the Medal of Honor winner, I question some of his... Well, Luke, I mean, Colonel Lucas... The, yes. Yeah, oh, yeah, well, that actually is, is fairly consistent. Um, I don't know. I mean, I question some of his rationale. Maybe. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, I, and not only that, but actually the various people that I've interviewed largely do the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Harrison did it in a real, real nonchalant way, mm -hmm. and, you know, the way an officer would do that. Yeah. But other, but others who dealt with him and had issues, I mean, that, that certainly, I mean, it came out in Nolan's book, but it also certainly came out in the interviews that, that, that I've done with him. Uh, I mean, but that was a guy who, you know, he was a good officer in a lot of ways, but when you got right down to it, he didn't know what it was like to be a foot soldier. Not and at he all. didn't, and that was his, the, the, his real gap was that understanding of how you could, what you could and couldn't do on the ground, because right. he'd never had that kind of field command. Yeah. So he was just up there in his helicopter and just pop down and throw guys back into a fight. Just not with it, having any concept at all. Yeah. Uh, I forget who it was, I think the guy that was in Michigan where he wanted him to charge after he fucked, man, he lost, uh, I forget how many men. And you know, that is the welfare of your damn troops. Yeah, yeah. well that was it, well, Jeff Wilcox. Wilcox. Was, yeah, name. yeah, uh, first guy I, I met actually. Uh, he oh, got yeah. involved with Rip Progress, but yeah, but that was, but that's sort of this, you know, that he ruined his military career by refusing to get his men killed in a hopeless situation. I trashed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, that's what's so low, man. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's like we said, we shouldn't be questioning it, but in the way he reminded me of Custer's, like just mm -hmm. uh, his, uh, you know, my way or the highway kind yeah. of bullshit. Yeah, you know, and there are situations where it, that kind of approach, you know, can work and has worked, and this wasn't one of them. Ultimately, you had to understand the physical situation the men were in before you go around making that kind of declaration. Oh, I agree, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. all right. Um, so, now that you've kind of gotten to sort of your, you know, 40 years and, you know, on after all of this, you, you look back at uh, your, your time in, in the Army, overall, what kind of effect do you think it had on you, or what did you, ta what did you take out of it, good or bad? I have a, a lot deeper feeling for religion than I, than I ever thought possible. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not, I'm not outwardly religious, but I, but I understand it better than what I used to. Um, what, uh, you know, it's been one of the most major influences on my life. Mm -hmm. Not only the, uh, uh, my art, uh, my concept of living, my respect for life. Mm -hmm. um, those are the positive things. I, I don't like to, to dwell some of the things that, mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, I did that, uh, you know, it's, uh, I, I did because of, uh, you know, uh, my fellow soldiers or, mm -hmm. or whatever. But, you know, it's like every veteran, we all think we never did enough. Mm -hmm. So, I, the, uh, yeah. that's, that's what I feel. I think coming out of Vietnam, that may be particularly easy to feel, because in a way, it was sort of all unfinished. It was finished for us, mm -hmm. because I think every one of us knows that we did the, the best that we could do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I am supremely proud of, of how we conducted ourselves. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I think that makes a pretty good conclusion point, so I'd like to just thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Hey, no problem. Hey, you know, uh, I'm just glad now there's finally, you know, Ripcord is finally getting the recognition it deserves. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right.